Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's National Geographic Education uh, Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. Uh, for those new to Explorer Classroom, uh, please make sure you check out the National Geographic Education website for all sorts of great resources, videos, and other things, fun things that you can use uh, in your classrooms. I'm very excited uh, today to be joined by classrooms in Canada and the United States. Um, there's many more classrooms who are gonna be watching live uh, via YouTube today. So if you do wanna get in on the action, you can either share via social media using the hashtag Explore Classroom, or you can send in questions to us directly with the YouTube chat sidebar. Uh, let us know who you are and where you're watching from and we'll sneak some of your questions in. So it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome our guest today, Asha DeVos. Uh, Asha is a veteran of Explorer Classroom. She kicked things off for us last year. Um, she's in Sri Lanka today. She's a Sri Lankan and she's going to tell us about the unorthodox blue whale population she studies in the Indian Oceans. So she was the first uh, person to get a PhD um, from Sri Lanka researching marine mammals. She's a National Geographic Emerging Explorer and a TED Senior Fellow. And she's also founded Oceans Well, an organization aiming to change um, the trajectory of our world's oceans. So by educating the next generation of ocean heroes, particularly equipping students from underrepresented nations to conduct marine conservation research and really introduce everybody to our incredible oceans and why they need to be protected. So Asha, it's always a pleasure to join you. Your story is amazing. And uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Well, this evening thank for you. you. So thank you for staying up. Yep. <laughs> it's still 6.30. It's not yet bedtime. I can stay with oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's awesome. Thank you so much. It's always fun to be here on your Google Hangouts. Joe, I've enjoyed, you know, how many have we done? Maybe three or four, perhaps, uh, through some crazy conditions. The last time, I think I had a big power outage and there was crazy rain going on outside. So we had internet problems. But it's always fun to come in and be able to engage with all these incredible bright young minds all I can see how eagerly they're waiting to hear the stories and that is all we need that's the magic ingredient your wide open mind absolutely I agree with you a hundred percent on that and I've had the pleasure of hearing your story a few times now and you always throw little exciting tidbits in so I'm very excited um, for today and I know the Perfect. classrooms are going to learn a lot Sweet. Okay. Well, I'm ready to kick it off. If uh, everyone else, are you are you all ready? Let's turn on some microphones. Let's hear them this morning. So, boys and yes. girls, if you're ready, let Asha know. <laughs> I think they're ready. I think they might be. Super, super exciting stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, and so I'm going to talk to all of you. I'm going to tell you. Oh, I will tell. Oops. Looks like our class in New Jersey made it in. New Jersey, how are you? Oh, perfect. All right, victory. Can you guys mute your microphone on your end for me? I think you're using an iPad, so I can't control it. All right, they're on it. Sorry, Asha. Okay, take perfect. it away. That's fine. Okay, so I'm going to. I'm going to show you some pictures, tell you a story. I am going to tell you the story of the whales that I work with. But in the process, I'm also going to tell you a little bit about my journey because I think in some ways that's kind of, I think, you know, because my story starts when I was about your age or maybe younger than some of you, I think it would be really interesting for you to see what kind of a journey can lead you to do some of the stuff that I do. Um, so, uh, Joe, can you see the screen okay? Is everything okay? We got it. We're going to channel our inner explorer. All right. So, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about channeling your little inner explorer today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the lessons I've learned along the way. And I'm going to tell you about this incredible population of blue whales that lives in the northern Indian Ocean, which is around my little island home of Sri Lanka. So I'll show you where that is shortly as well while I do this talk. But um, I hope you listen and be excited. And I'm hoping you all learn something new. And at the end, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to any questions that you might have. So. So this is where I start. This is where I always start this presentation because I start with my dream. 
Um, and my dream is to be a voice from a part of the world that is rarely listened to, speaking on behalf of a part of the planet that is often overlooked. So I think the ocean is very much overlooked. We don't talk about it enough on an everyday basis, but it makes up 70% of our planet. So I think we should be talking about it more often than we do. Okay, so my whole life goal, my dream is to really ensure that more people are talking about the oceans on an everyday basis. But the most important thing I can share with you, well, one of them, I'm hoping there'll be more other important things too, is that there is no such thing as overnight success. Okay, so this is me standing on a stage. I don't know how many of you have ever watched TED Talks. I'm sure some of you have. Um, so this is me giving a talk at you know, one of the TED conferences, it was a huge moment for me. But the thing is, I didn't just wake up one, one morning and just like, go get on that stage. I got on that stage because it, it was years and years of hard work that and decisions that I made along the way that allowed me to finally one day get up on that stage and tell this incredible story about something that I think is really important and it's to do with whales, okay? So, so don't remember that every step that you take is an important part of your success story. So this is where it all began. I think there's a few of you in the room, uh, in some of the classrooms who look about that size. I'm the little one with the pigtails. The other one's my older brother. Um, I must have been about maybe five, six years old at this age. And I. this is when I, my whole journey began. This is when I started to dream of becoming an adventurous scientist because I used to um, flip through old National Geographic magazines and I used to see all these incredible explorers and I used to think, wow, someday I want to be like that. I want to see things no one will ever see. I want to go places no one ever will ever go. I want to experience the world in a way that no one else will experience it. Okay, so my dream started at that very young age. So whatever your dreams are right now, don't throw them out the window. Because one of the things I'd like to remind you all is that we we all have superpowers. We all have superpowers. We just take, you know, different amounts of time to discover what they are. But the one superpower that we all have, that we all have right now is the power to dream. And no one can take your dreams away from you because they're locked within yourself. But if you can dream and then set some goals for yourself and just keep following your dream, you can get anywhere you want to. Okay, so as a little girl, as a six-year-old, I dreamed of becoming a marine biologist and an adventurous scientist. And this is where I've ended up today. So dreaming works. So dream and have goals. That's my first kind of the first piece of wisdom I want to impart on you is remember to have dreams, keep those dreams, never let go of your dreams. Remember they're your dreams. You keep working for them. You will achieve them. So now to tell the story, I'm going to actually take you away from where you are right now. So you are all the way in North America, um, but I'm going to take you literally to the other side of the globe. So if you have a globe somewhere close or you have a world map, have a look at it. You can see that I right where I am sitting right now is literally on the other side of the globe. And I'm taking you to this beautiful little tropical island in the middle of the northern Indian Ocean um, called Sri Lanka. So you can see it's uh, shaped like a little teardrop. It's called the Pearl of the Indian Ocean. Um, and this is the island that I call home. This is where I was born and where I was brought up. So I don't know how many of you have been here or know stories of Sri Lanka, but it is an incredibly, incredibly beautiful place. And when I was young, when I was 18 and I decided I wanted to go off, I realized 18 is old for you guys, but it's young for me. Um, so I wanted to go off and become this marine biologist. And I kept telling people, oh, I'm going to go off to university and be a marine biologist. And people would, uh, would ask me, like, what are you going to do with that degree? Because I come from a country where people don't necessarily, we don't play in the ocean. We don't grow up playing in the ocean, like in a lot of other parts of the world. The ocean is seen as a place where people go to work. So fishermen will go to work they'll go to the ocean. But the way we engage with our ocean is very different uh, for, for many reasons. But um, so when I decided I want to be a marine biologist, I come from a country where there's no, like literally less than five marine biologists in an island that's not that tiny. And so um, people were really surprised. They couldn't believe that, like, I would want to do something that was an unheard of job. And everyone was trying to discourage me. People were like, oh, well, you know, what are you going to do? You won't have a job when you come back to Sri Lanka. Or maybe you'll never come back to Sri Lanka. And I was like, don't worry, I'm going to carve my own niche. And the one thing you have to remember is that people will give you advice. 
always listen to advice. There are people who've lived longer lives than you. There are people who've had more experience in the world. It could be your parents, your grandparents, um, your teachers. Uh, but um, you can always listen. But remember that at the end of the day, it's your life. So you have to make up your mind what you want to do with it. As long as you're not having a negative impact on anyone else, as long as you're not having a negative impact on the planet, then remember your dreams are valid. You, it's OK for you to want something for yourself, because in the end, you have to live this life of yours. So off I went to university. I convinced, you know, my parents were very supportive. They said, do what you love and you'll do it well. I said, fine, I want to be a marine biologist. They were like, OK, well, you can't be a marine biologist in Sri Lanka. You can't do a university de degree in it. So I had to actually then pack my bags at the age of 18, move a, like, you know, a third of the way across the world to Scotland. Um, to live by myself for the first time in my life um, and in a foreign country where it was cold. And honestly, you know, I came from a beautiful tropical warm island with sandy beaches and coconut trees. And there I went off to a beautiful town uh, with a beach, uh, but it was really cold and I could never go for a swim in the ocean. So, um, but I did this because I knew that I had to take this step if I was going to achieve my dream. And then when I finished my undergraduate, I wanted to go off and do fieldwork. So when I was in university, I learned a lot of things, you know, from my textbooks and from my professors. But then I wanted to go and feel what marine biology was like. I wanted to go and get my hands dirty. I wanted to go and sit on boats. I wanted to go and like, you know, do whatever it meant to become a marine biologist because I wanted to know what it really was like. And so um, I actually then went off, uh, decided to go and get some fieldwork experience. And like I said, can, since I couldn't get this experience in Sri Lanka, I had to decide, you know, go somewhere else in the world. So I picked New Zealand because they do a lot of good conservation work. I felt there were projects that I could be involved in. And so I saved up all my money to get myself to New Zealand to go and get this experience. And actually, uh, to, I didn't have much money. And so the way I made money to save up to be able to go was that I became what we call a tatty roger in Scotland. And in, in, in Scotland, a tatty is a potato. Uh, and basically what I was doing was I was digging rotting potatoes out of fields um, to sort of make money and uh, you know get paid. So I'd spend days in actually the hot sun, surprisingly, the hot sun walking up and down these rows of potatoes and digging all the rotten ones out and they were squelchy and they stank and like when you got it on your hand you couldn't get the smell off for like a whole day but that's what I did to be able to save up enough money to get myself to New Zealand and then when I got to New Zealand I realized that it didn't matter how much money I'd saved by doing that work I didn't have enough money to stay in you know even like a hostel or like a little hotel or I couldn't rent a house or I couldn't find any accommodation that I could afford so I actually ended up living in a tent for the most part of six months so that's me living in this tent um, it was it was really fun um, for example one morning I woke up and it had rained so hard there was a moat uh, a waterway right around my tent and I unzipped the front entrance and there were ducks basically swimming right outside my tent so you know that I mean I wouldn't have that story to tell if I hadn't sat, sat in a tent so the important thing here is to remember seek experiences life is an incredible place you have the opportunity to make whatever you want of it and the most precious thing is to seek different experiences try things you know try good things uh, because you never know what parts it'll lead you down now had i turned around and said oh i don't have enough money i can't do this I would have never become a marine biologist. I would never be where I am today. But I decided I was going to take whatever experiences I had, no matter how I had to do it. And that is what allowed me to continue on this path. So then while I was living in this tent, um, I actually uh, heard about this whale research vessel that was going uh, from San Diego right around the world. Okay, so all most of you would know, or all of you will know where San Diego is. It is in the US, um, on the west coast of the US. Um, so it was going from San Diego, it was going right around the world and coming back to San Diego over five years. And basically what they were doing was they were doing research with sperm whales. And I heard that this boat was now going to stop in Sri Lanka on its travels and the Maldive Islands, which is very close to Sri Lanka. It's this island chain that's really close to Sri Lanka. 
As soon as I heard about that, I knew I had to get onto this boat because out here where I live, we don't have many of those experiences. Uh, we don't have these opportunities very often. So whenever an opportunity comes up, you know, I, you, I feel like you need to make the most of it. If an opportunity presents itself, do what you can. Uh, if you really believe that you want that opportunity, then work hard to try to get that opportunity, right? So I wrote to the owner of the boat and I said, look, I hear you're coming to Sri Lanka. I hear you're coming to the malls. I would really like to get on board because my dream is to become a marine biologist. My dream is to uh, study whales. And, um, you know, if I can get on this boat, I know I'll be able to do it. And they wrote back within a day. And I was like, wow, they replied my email. And the first thing they say is, I'm very sorry, we don't have any space for you. And I was very sad uh, because... Like I said, this was my dream, right? So like, if I couldn't do this, then how was I gonna achieve this dream of mine? So I actually wrote to them uh, many times over a number of months. And actually, to be honest, I wrote to them every day for three months. Um, basically negotiating, basically telling them what I would bring to the table, what my skills were, what I was willing to do, and essentially marketing myself, right? So I, at that point, I figured that, all I needed to do was get on the boat, no matter what job they gave me. And so, um, and then I would prove myself and show them that I could do science. So they let me on. They said, okay, well, if you can come out to the Maldives, which is the islands next to Sri Lanka, um, we can let you on for two weeks. And I said, fine. And they said, yeah, but you're not coming on as a scientist. You're not coming on as a science intern. You, you come on as a deckhand. So I'm sure some of you know what a deckhand is. Basically, a deckhand is someone who cleans the toilets, polishes, polishes brass, cooks meals, and basically just runs around doing all the odd jobs on the boat. But at this point, I didn't think it was a big deal for me to do that because I knew if I could get on that boat, once I was on the boat, I could do all my deckhand duties and then I could offer my help to do any of the sciencey stuff so I could get experience, but then I could also show them that I was capable of doing stuff, right? So, so this is me. This is the first time I ever appeared on the internet back in the day. Um, and, you know, by the end of the two weeks in the Maldives, they thought I was so hardworking and they loved the fact that I was willing to do anything. They said, you know what? We're going to give you a chance to be a science intern as well. So I sort of got a bit of an upgrade in my jobs. So I wasn't just cleaning the toilets. I was also, you know, taking photographs of whales. I was helping them to sort in the lab. So I was doing all sorts of other things. And I was getting, you know, again, another step closer to my goal. So remember, I wrote to them every day for three months until they let me on. So be persistent. You have a dream. Hold on to that dream. Um, but don't be annoying. So I didn't write to them and say, oh, you know what? I think I deserve to be on your board. Well, I think you should take me on. I wasn't being annoying. I wasn't being entitled. I wasn't insisting that they took me on. But I was just saying, you know what? I really, really would value this. And you know what? I'm willing to do absolutely anything. So I bargained for that place on the boat and that's how i got it in the end and then work hard never underestimate the power of working hard and i can tell you i definitely worked hard i did anything they wanted me to do and i also came up with tasks that they didn't know that they wanted me to do and i would say hey you know shall i do this and they'd be like oh that's a good idea go and go on do it and that showed that i was able to think on my on my own and come up with ideas of my own and all these things you know like they do mean a lot and take whatever you can get. If someone offers you a job as a deckhand and you want to be a scientist, don't think you're too good for the job. Remember, that job can take you to the next level. So think about it strategically. Remember that these you never know what these opportunities can offer in the long term. So my work with the Blue Whales, which is obviously the work that I've immersed myself in for well over 10 years now, um, almost 15 years actually, um, started when I was actually working on this research vessel. So it was this beautiful, flat, calm day off the southeast coast of Sri Lanka. So we'd sailed from the Maldives to Sri Lanka. We were on the southeast coast of the island. Um, and we were doing this research with the sperm mills, right? So what we were doing, we, we were dropping an underwater microphone into the water. And using this underwater microphone, we were listening for the sound of sperm mills. And when we heard the sperm mills, we would try to find them um, in the water we'd look around try to find them try to get up close to them and then take these little samples that could um from the sperm whales that could allow us to study what kind of um 
you know, pesticides and other toxins that were in the oceans. And so this one particular day we were out there and, you know, it's very expensive to actually conduct research on the oceans. Um, so because you have to, you know, there's a cost of the boat, there's costs of fuel, you're kind of out there. So you have to have all the safety equipment. It's not, um, it's, it's a lot more costly than doing research on land. And so when you're out there, you want to collect as much data as possible. So we used to always have someone um, on the deck of the boat looking out for the sperm whales, but also any other signs of life, anything at all. We would document it, write it down, um, because that's all important science, okay? So this particular day, I happened to be on the top, on the deck of the boat. And I was looking out for these sperm whales that we'd been hearing for 24 hours. We'd been following them all night um, through their sound, but we hadn't seen them yet. And we really wanted to see them. And I was on the deck and I was thinking, gosh, they must be out here somewhere. So I was standing there, strange, staring out in the ocean. And it was this beautiful day, but it was super hot. And you can see how flat the ocean is. And that's because there wasn't any wind. So it was very, very hot. But I was like, and I knew what I was looking for because I'd seen sperm whales already. And sperm whales are really interesting because when they exhale, when they blow, uh, their exhalation sl sl slants off to the left-hand side because they only have one nostril or blowhole on the left-hand side of their heads. And so, you know, you can see them from far, especially on good condition days like this. So I'm standing there staring, no signs at all. And then, you know, hours and hours later, I saw this. This is this was something different. This was something I hadn't seen. This was something unique and unusual. It was this gigantic tower of exhalation that rose, you know, 10, 12 feet into the sky. Um, that's over like twice my height, you know, and so high in the sky. And I looked at it and it was, you know, a couple of kilometers away. And I thought, wow, that's something special. Because for that kind of massive, powerful, tall, vertical blow, the animal that produced it had to be humongous. And so I quickly grabbed the walkie-talkie and I called down to the captain of the boat and I said, Bob, I don't know, but I think we should go um, you know, at 11 o'clock. So our directions are based on the face of a clock. So if you think about the direction that 11 o'clock is, it's not straight ahead, but it's off the lift. So I'm like, go to, we need to go 11 o'clock for two kilometers. And he says, why? And I said, I think there's a blue whale. And he says, okay. So he immediately moves the boat away from the direction we were going in, in the hope of finding sperm whales. And we start moving towards this apparent blue whale. So now I'm staring at this and I'm thinking, wow, what if I've made a mistake? What if it's not a blue whale? What if it's something that's not so exciting? And I'm starting to panic because I'm just the science intern, right? Like I am a newbie in this field. I'm like here trying to sort of make my point, trying to create a career for myself. And if I mess up here, like, oh my gosh, what will people think? Anyway, so we start moving closer and closer and closer and closer. And that's when I start to think I'm losing my mind because there's not just one blue whale there, but there's six blue whales in an area the size of a soccer pitch. So if you can all visualize the size of a soccer pitch and remember that a blue whale is about the length of a basketball court, you can get a sense of how jam-packed, how sardine-packed they were in this little area. And like I said at the start, the ocean is 70% of our planet. So if you were an animal that big and you had all that space to roam, why on earth would you hang out in such a tight little area with so many others of your kind? And that's the first thing that I thought. I thought, why on earth would you do that? And so then I started thinking about what my textbooks and my t professors in university had told me because I'd just come out of my undergraduate and I felt I had some answers in my head based on what I'd been learning. And I thought, well, from what I know, blue whales um, undertake, they go do long range migrations between cold feeding areas. So places like Antarctic are really great feeding areas because there's lots of food in cold water. And then after they feed and feed and feed and feed, they start traveling when the ice starts to form in the Antarctic, when you get towards winter and there's no, it's all icy. So the whales can't hang out there and there's not enough food. They start moving towards the, pole, the, the tropical areas of the ocean, warm waters where they go to breed and calve. So they go find their mates and then they go and have babies. And so I thought to myself, well, you know, Sri Lanka is 
only five degrees above the equator. So it's very warm, very tropical water. So obviously these whales are here either finding their mates or they're having babies. And I thought, wow, I could be the first person in the world to actually experience this or see this. And so I was really excited. So we get closer and closer and closer and we get to this spot. And honestly, these whales weren't doing anything exciting. They were just hanging out, swimming around. Some of them were diving. There was definitely no like babies being born and they weren't doing anything of significance. And I thought to myself, what is going on, right? Like my textbook said something, but that's not what I'm seeing. And so um, I said to cap my captain, I said, look, can we just hang around here for a little while? Just see what's happening, right? And he says, sure, like that's fine. And that's when I saw this. Um, I don't know how many of you are guessing what this is, but this, my friends, is blue whale poop. Yep, you heard me right. That's what blue whale poop looks like. It's bright red because they feed on these tiny little shrimp-like creatures that have this red oil in their bodies. And that's what makes their poop red. And I think it's extremely beautiful. I think it's the most beautiful poop in the animal kingdom. And I always challenge my audiences to... Um, if they ever see anything more beautiful than that, any other poop that's more beautiful, to please send in a photograph because I'd be pretty interest, interested to see. And to date, no one in 15 years of asking, no one's been able to top this photograph. But the point here is I saw this poop and I thought to myself, wow. So if an animal is pooping, that means it's feeding somewhere close by, right? And remember what I told you, I said, blue whales feed in cold waters, but I told you Sri Lankan waters are warm. So what on earth is going on? And that's exactly why I call this my Eureka moment, because suddenly I realized that these blue whales were doing something different. They weren't obeying the rules that we had as humans had created for them. We, you know, our assumption was that they all blue whales went to cold waters to feed. But what if these guys were actually feeding in these warm waters? What was going on? How was the environment allowing them to do that how is it possible for them to do that why are they doing this why aren't they going to cold waters these are the kinds of questions that came to my mind as soon as i saw this and at this point what i want to tell you is this really shows the importance of being curious being curious is such a privilege and it's such a beautiful thing because we have the freedom to ask questions and that is such an in incredibly important thing for you know, make, getting, you know, uh, your mind to grow and to experience the world in a whole different way. And, you know, I, um, if I had seen this poop and gone, oh, that's disgusting. Oh, we should go away and not thought about it twice. I wouldn't have started my project. I wouldn't have had a Eureka moment. I wouldn't have made a groundbreaking discovery. I would have just missed out on an incredibly important moment in time. But instead, I embraced this. I said, wow, they're feeding here. That's weird. They're not supposed to be feeding here. No one's ever said that blue whales feed in warm waters. They always say they feed in cold waters. So I want to know more. And I was really curious and I asked all these questions. And that's what led me down this path towards the work that I do today, which is totally dedicated to these blue whales and um, you know, their preservation, their conservation in light of all the threats that they face in these waters. Um, oops. And so in the process, I also earned the title. You can see this is an, uh, a magazine called Popular Science. And you can see they call, uh, they say, whale feces collector and nine even worse jobs in science. So feces is poop. Uh, basically, people think that collecting whale poop is a crappy job. I'm going to say that it's not. I don't think it's a bad job at all. I actually... I have a freezer full of poop at home and I don't just collect it for fun. I collect it for science because this poop can tell me so much about these animals. It can tell me what they feed on. It can tell me what's if they have any worms or other parasites in their bellies. Uh, it can tell me how the different kinds of food they feed on might change through a year or over multiple years. So it's really, really precious data for me. And so my freezer is full of this stuff. My mom actually um, wasn't so pleased about having it in her freezer. So I had to buy a special freezer separate for my sa poop samples, uh, which is probably a good idea. So 
here's a here's a great quote that I love sharing with people, and it says, "Discovery is seeing what everybody else has seen, and thinking what nobody else has thought." Now think about it, right? So I'm sure lots of people have seen blue whale poop. I'm really convinced that there's way more people than just me who've seen blue whale poop, but Maybe they didn't think outside the box. Maybe they didn't think, well, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean if they're pooping in Sri Lankan waters, in these warm waters? What does that indicate? Maybe nobody thought beyond that. And so my advantage was that I saw something that other people had seen, but I thought something that no one else had thought. And so that became my first big discovery. So just a few more tips and tricks uh, about life in general, about, you know, as you progress through life. This is me and my team that's in there in the red uh, rain jacket, um, and that's the rest of the crew. We actually spend a lot of time standing on the side of the boat, like it's sometimes eight hours a day. S many days we'll see whales, some days we won't see anything at all, but we have to stay staying in the ocean. And I always say be vigilant. So being vigilant means uh, be sharp, you know, always be aware, always be, you know, keep your eyes and your mind open to anything that might happen because you never know what to expect. And the more you look out for things in this world, the more you pay attention to the little things, the more attention you pay to whatever's going on around you. Um, the more surprises that are going to come out of it. And here is actually a swarm of these tiny little shrimp-like creatures uh, called krill that um, we found in uh, one day in when we were out in the, uh, on the ocean doing work. And what I need to tell you is we don't typically see these swarms, right? And I've been working with these whales for about six years or five or six years before I actually saw a swarm of these and it's not that I wasn't paying attention I was but it's just that this is a rare occurrence in our waters and it was a very exciting occurrence because again it meant more science for me and so the other thing I always tell even my students who work on the water with me who got into the field I say expect the unexpected this world is full of magic this world is full of surprises the ocean is incredibly magical because we've only explored 5% of our oceans right so we have to always expect the unexpected you know, the more we can be open-minded and open-hearted to new things happening, then the more we can actually progress in life, the more we can push boundaries and make discoveries and have incredible Eureka moments or just, you know, carve a more interesting life for ourselves. So that's me with a jar of those little krill. I was extremely excited because I'd waited seven or eight, six or seven years, and I was so stoked that day when we saw it, quite by accident, but it you know, we, we didn't miss it because we were expecting the unexpected every single day when we were on the water. And this is one of those unexpected things. The other thing I'd say is find your tribe and keep them close. And by that, I meant, you know, we all have a support team. It may be an aunt, an uncle, grandparents, brothers, sisters, parents, um, a teacher. Teachers are great um, supporters of uh, a lot of us. Um, you never know who it is, but when you find those people, when you find those people who encourage you, who see your dreams, who believe in your dreams, who know that you, you are a magical human being on the inside and who want to help you to find that magic and ch change the world for, a bit, for the better, make sure you keep them close. Um, so for me, I always tell people my magic ingredient in my success story is my parents because they told me, do what you love and you'll do it well. And that's all the, the, all the rules that they placed on me. And I know for a fact that they're not going to always tell me I'm right. When I do stuff that's not right, I know they'll tell me that I shouldn't have done that. And that's really important too because if someone's just going to tell you you're right all the time and praise you and tell you how wonderful you are and how amazing you are, you'll never learn the lessons of life. You'll never learn how to get better. And so it's important that the people you keep around you, not that I'm saying they should be critical and nasty, but they should be able to convey to you like, hey, I know, I think you should have done this a little differently. And those are the moments that allow you to actually grow and uh, become a better person as well as, you know, progressing maybe your career and stuff. So these are just some of the people I keep close to me who uh, have really helped to change my life and who have helped and supported me on my journeys. And I want to, as another quote, because I think this is exciting and this is actually really, uh, I think more uh, targeted to the teachers in the room. 
Um, and it says, it's important that students bring a certain ragamuffin barefoot irreverence to their studies. They're not there to worship what is known, but to question it. And so this is the point. We live in a world that's constantly changing. What we know changes from day to day. You know, 15 years ago, we thought that all blue whales fed in cold waters. And that's what everyone taught us, the textbooks, the teachers, the professors, that was it. Until that day, I discovered that actually there's this one group of blue whales in the world that breaks that rule. They tend to feed in warm waters. And the point is, you know, you have to leave room for students to, um, to uh, bend the rules, you know, by using their brains and by thinking and by being curious. And to all you students, just be curious and you never know what and challenge ask questions There's, you don't have to be rude you don't have to like be critical but you can ask questions your teacher might tell you something and if you think well i don't know i think it could be different go off go home do a little bit of research on your own and then come back and say hey you know what teacher i think that maybe this is not right because i read uh that such and such a thing is more accurate and then maybe your teacher and you can have a conversation and you'll realize that maybe you're right or you're wrong or whatever and i think that's a great way to learn so just be open to also like don't fight don't argue do your research come back with the facts and have a conversation with whoever it is teachers parents whoever and Ultimately, I say, whatever you do in life, always have fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. And that's what I tell all the students and all my the guys, my staff who work with me. I say, if you're not having fun, if this is like boring and it's horrible, then we need to rethink how we're doing stuff and start all over again. And so this is just a really quick video of us, of... Um, Let's see, I'll tell you which one it is. I have so many videos. Oh, this is. So this is us actually um, out on the water. Ooh, it, sorry, that wasn't meant to happen. I apologize. Um, this is us out on the water collecting those krill. You know, expect the unexpected. Remove the little creatures that I told you that we collected. So I just want to show you, we have a lot of fun when we work. Um, and we love to share what we do with the world. So we use pretty basic equipment out here because we don't have a lot of fun sometimes to do the work we do. So we collect, we were collecting samples with just a tea strainer. So don't think you have to have the fanciest equipment to do anything in life. Sometimes you can innovate and improvise and invent things that are simpler, low cost, and allow you to do what you want to do. All smiles all over the board. Check that out. So this is us. We take the samples and then we put them into ethanol to make sure that they last. They're these tiny little creatures. And you can see. And then we put them into ethanol to preserve them because otherwise we can't take them to the lab to look at what they really are. And that's important for us to understand because these are things that are eaten by, you know, other creatures in the ocean and they're important for us to study. And yep, and that's that's the end of my presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You're back. I am. Can you see me? I can't see myself. Yep. Yeah, we gotcha. Oh. Okay. Well, I can't see me, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Or I can't see anyone. Why is my screen blocked? Okay. Well, it's okay. I I will pretend I can see everyone. And I'll try to figure okay. out what's going on well, right now. I can guarantee you they're a good-looking group of classrooms. 
Um, I know, but I'd like to see them. I don't understand. It's, uh, there's something blocking my screen. I'll try to... Can you see if I'm fiddling? Because I don't want to be distracting. But I would like to figure out what this is and try to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, work away at it. We'll, I'll introduce some classrooms. We'll start some questions. And hopefully, we can, yep. we can figure out what's going on on your end. So I'll just give a quick shout out to Mrs. Langer's group. They have to switch to their next class. Um, but thanks for hanging okay. out with us, guys. They were thank you uh, Kohlberg, a grade six seven class in here in Ontario, Canada. So not too far from me, actually. Oh, All right. nice. Yeah. So a reminder: any groups watching online, please use the YouTube chat sidebar. It's right next to the YouTube screen. Um, you can send in some questions that way. Uh, let us know who you are, and we'll put a question or two in. And also, any classrooms who are taking any pictures, please share via Twitter with the Hashtag explore classroom because we want to see uh, you guys in action. But let's meet yep. our first our first group, Mrs. Close's class. Mm -hmm. They are joining us from um, Freehold, New Jersey, and they're a grade three classroom. If you guys have a question for Asha, go ahead. Um, so, do you remember in that presentation, like after she made that presentation at the end? Yeah. Who made the present? Remember when you caught in the ocean and then you had to put the ethanol? Yep. What did you catch? So those were tiny little shrimp like creatures called krill that are formed the part of a, the diet of blue whales in most parts of the world. So the tiny, tiny, tiny little things that look like little prawns or shrimp basically. Okay. Do whales eat anything else? So here's the cool thing, right? Blue whales, um, like a lot of large whales, are what we call baleen whales. They don't have teeth. They have these comb-like structures in their mouth that's made of the same thing as your hand nails. And so because they have that, what how they feed is they actually find dense patches of things like krill or little shrimpy, whatever, krilly things. And they take open their mouths and they take big gulps. and as they do so, they take in a lot of water as well as these, as these krill. And then they push out all the water using their tongues. So you can imagine that if there's anything kind of hanging out near these krill swarms, they can get swallowed by accident, like little things, right? Like jellyfish, perhaps, or whatever. But really, these blue whales are known to feed really exclusively on these things called krill. So largely, this is what they feed on. Accidentally, they may feed on a few other things. All right, let's jump to another classroom. Um, oh, you're back. Oh, great. OK. So oh, you happened? can see us? Good. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, I'm just going to pop to Mrs. Russell's class quickly. They're in Caledon, a grade 7 class. And I think that their time is getting close. Do you guys have a quick question? Yeah, we do. For Asha. Awesome. What is the most endangered species? Sea species and why? Uh, oh, that's a good question. There's quite a few things out there that are endangered. So here, as in terms of marine mammals, there's uh, the North Atlantic right whale that's very endangered. It's probably the most endangered whale. Um, but uh, there's a lot of species in the ocean that's unfortunately endangered because there's a lot of stuff going on in the ocean that is caused by humans that we don't really understand how it's impacting the ocean. So. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question, but the list is longer than you'd want it to be. All right. Mrs. Penfold's group, they're a big group joining us from um, Orangeville, Ontario. Um, classrooms between K to 8, and I bet you they have some questions. I mean, it's a big group. So first of all, can you guys be loud? Let's hear you nice and loud. Let's hear you nice and loud. All right, fire A with a question. Um, have you ever swam with a blue whale? So as a researcher, I'm really interested in trying to understand how an animal behaves in its natural environment when it's not being harassed. And so as a result, the one thing with blue whales is that blue whales, as big as they are, 
they're really very nervous animals. So even when we work on boats, we try to keep a big distance away from them when we're working with them so we don't disturb them. When people get in the water with them, it's really disturbing. And that actually really affects the behavior of the animals and we don't know what other impacts can have. So for that reason, I actually do all my work off boats and I respect the distance between me and my whales. And I just sit back and I watch what's going on and I collect all the information I need to. So I don't actually get in the water with them. All right, good question. We're going to come back to your group, but let's grab a question from another one of our classes joining us. So um, we're going to head to New Jersey now. Um, Sayreville, New Jersey, with a grade six classroom. Mrs. Hawkenos group, let me turn your microphone on. Or you might have to do it on your end if you're using an iPad. You might have to turn it on for me. I think I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> or we could for a moment. Can you try and unmute again for us? Sure. Oh, I heard you. Go ahead if you have a question. Then mute it again. Oh, what is it? What is the greatest predator of the blue whale? Ah, that's a good question. Do you know the greatest predator of the blue whale was the human being? That's us. It's the largest animal that's ever roamed the planet, and it didn't have any natural predators until we started killing them, you know, um, maybe, you know, in the, in the 50, 1950s, for example, 1960s. And we figured out, we were the only ones who could figure out how to kill them because before that they were faster than everything in the ocean and bigger than everything in the ocean. So nothing got in the way. And to date, even though we don't hunt them anymore, we still are the biggest predator in many ways because our actions are the only things that can really kill these whales. So um, I would say that's the biggest predator in the ocean. All of us, our people. All right. I agree with you 100%. We way too much fishing power for the size of the planet that we have. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. All right. Mrs. Cord's group, they're joining us from Pico Riviera in California. They're a group of grade seven students. Give me a moment to fire up your microphone. And if you have a question, come on up. Oh, I want to go. Oh, um. You can see you look oh, oh, wait, no. Hi. Um, so my question, uh, thank you for being a scientist and being, like, so into it, but uh, I have this question. Why mm -hmm. do you, like, strive to find, like, why do you care so much for whales and um, why do you care so much for them and why are you always trying to, like, find a new, uh, like, answer to science? Like, why are they in the um, warm water? They should be in cold water. Like, mm -hmm. uh, why is it uh, okay so for me uh i i just so for me i discovered this new population of blue whales and that's what made me excited about studying whales and that's what kept me on the path but i'll tell you the most exciting thing about being a scientist or being a researcher is that you get to ask a question and then you got you have to figure out the answer and it's actually like a big adventure. And that's how I see science. That's why I will, you know, I'll ask that question. I'll be like, wait, why are these whales in these waters? Like, I don't understand, you know, why they're feeding here. And that was my big question. And then I had to figure out what steps I had to take to try to answer that question. And so it really is like a gigantic adventure, you know, to answer that question. It took me, you know, about a year or almost, it actually took me about three and a half years to be able to answer that question at least uh, a little bit. And so you can imagine these, these are lifelong projects. You ask a question, they don't, you can't necessarily resolve them overnight. It takes time, it takes persistence, it takes a lot of dedication and hard work. So that's why I'm sort of, I get stuck into the questions and I keep going with them. So I've lost the screen all over again, but it doesn't matter because I'm sure I'll come back. I don't know what's going on. All right, well we have, a little bonus, Mrs. Langer's group switched classrooms, but her grade four fives came in. So you Ooh. can see them down there. I'll put them up on the screen. Wave, guys, if you can hear us. There they are. And they typed me in a question. They sent me a question. They're wondering 
Um, how long can a, can a blue whale be? Maybe the biggest one or maybe the average? How big? Oh, okay. So they can grow to about um, the longest that they've ever found is one that grows to about 100 feet. Um, so you're going to have to ask uh, maybe a teacher to show you what 100 feet looks like if you're not entirely sure. But it's actually pretty big. It's about the length of a basketball court. So think about your basketball court and how long that is. And that's about as long, long as a blue whale will get. All right. Well, Asha, we have a few more minutes um, okay. for some questions. So I might just turn it over to classrooms if they want to send somebody up to the camera and then I know that they're ready with another question. And we'll, oh, that was quick. We've got mm -hmm. Mrs. Cord's group already in California. Microphone on. Um, um, what colleges did you go to to earn your degrees and how long did it take you to earn them? Okay, so that's a good question. So I, like I said, I had to leave Sri Lanka, unfortunately, to study, to do marine biology. I did my first degree, my undergraduate, in the, at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Um, and then I went off and I worked in New Zealand and in the Indian Ocean. So I took a year off there and then I went off to do my master's. So I did a second degree at the University of Oxford in England. After I finished that degree, that was one year. So my undergraduate, my first degree was four years. And then I took that year to work. And then I went off and did my master's for a year. And then I worked for four and a half years in conservation here in Sri Lanka because I wanted to get back on the ground and like meet people and connect with people. And then I started my PhD, which was at the University of Western Australia. Um, and that was uh, three and a half years. So I moved to Australia at that point. And straight after I finished there, I actually did what we call a postdoc. So after a PhD, you can do um, you can do more research at a university and it's called a postdoctoral uh, so it's kind of like a job. And I did that at the University of California, Santa Cruz. So I have actually lived in a lot of different places in my time, but home has always been Sri Lanka, and this is where I am now. And it all started in a tent. That's, yep. <laughs> that's a pretty impressive path. All right, I see someone in Mrs. Penfold's group. Uh, let me turn your microphone on. Let me turn your microphone on. So how much like of the like little fish did you get from one of the scoops from the boat? Sorry, could yeah. you repeat your question again, please? How much like krill did you get from one of the scoops? Okay, so that, that's a good question. So the krill swarm was actually gigantic. It was probably the size of an adult like a really densely packed swarm, but we just scooped our tea strainer in once. So we didn't actually collect that much. We probably collected maybe a handful of them because we don't need that much for the sake of science. We just need to, to answer questions. We need just a little handful um, for us to be able to look at them and tell what kind they are and, you know, stuff like that. So, so we just got a handful, but there was definitely a lot more in the ocean. So building on that, you took your little handful for science. A blue whale, though, if it came through, how much could it have taken? So they take, they eat about 40 million of those little krill a day. So imagine that. That's a lot of food. But then if you're that big, you kind of need a lot of food. A lot of food and a lot of samples for you to collect afterwards. So it's a win-win yeah, situation. Exactly. Lots of poop. Yeah. Okay, um, Mrs. Close's group in New Jersey, do you guys have another question? Yes, we do. Excellent. Um, are blue whales nocturnal? So, the, you know, it's what's interesting about whales and dolphins is that they, um, so you know how you breathe and you don't think about breathing, right? Like when you're sleeping, you're just breathing. When you're talking to someone, you're breathing. When you're running, you're breathing. When you're doing homework, you're breathing. But things like whales and dolphins, they actually have to think about breathing. They have to remember to breathe. And <clears throat> they can only breathe at the surface of the ocean. So they have to come up to the surface to breathe. Even if they dive down and look for food and spend you know, 15 minutes, some species can go for an hour and a half, they still have to come up to the surface if they want to breathe. So they aren't, they actually are um, sort of awake 
24 hours a day. But when they get tired and at night time, um, whales and dolphins actually go to sleep, but they sleep with only half their brains. So the reason they sleep with only half their brains, so they can switch off one half of their brains. And the reason they only switch off one half is because they have to be aware of what's going on around them. And they have to remember to breathe. If they fall asleep and switch off their whole brains, they will drown and die. And so um, th I, we don't know if they're nocturnal per se. I don't think they stay up all night. They, we see them up in the daytime. We sometimes see them up at night. But it is really cool that they can't sleep like us. They can't switch everything off and go to sleep because if they don't, if they do that, they'll forget to breathe and that would be a really bad problem. So um, I hope that answers your question somewhat. All right. And let's check in with our new grade six is in New Jersey one more time and see uh, if they have one more question. You might need to help me with your mic. Uh, uh, oh, can you try and click one more time? I think you clicked on and then off again. Okay. There's a tricky microphone over there. Switching. Try now. Other than the blue whale, what other animals do you study? Oh, so I um, so I studied blue whales. This year, I discovered a new species of whale in Sri Lankan waters. Uh, it's called an Omuras whale. So that's a new species that we'll probably do some work on. Uh, try to discover, you know, if there are many more of them, how many there are. Um, I also do some work with um, other species in terms of fish. Um, we uh, we work with dolphins also. So there's lots of species of dolphins. There's about 27 species of whales and dolphins in Sri Lankan waters. So I do collect data on all of them. Like I said, it's so expensive to be on the water that when I'm on the water, I collect data about anything and everything. We collect data about manta rays, about whale sharks. Um, you can actually, you know, if you do use um, any kind of social media, even in the classroom, you can follow my, me and my work um, at oceanswell.org, O-R-G. Um, we post a lot of videos of our work and stuff like that. So you can see the different kinds of things we do. And really, ultimately, while we do un try to understand these species, we do it for the sake of conservation. We want to protect these species um, so that future generations can also see them and experience them. And so we also take on big questions in marine conservation. We look at big picture, like not just the whales, but what about the whole ocean? How do we look after the entire ocean? What do we have to think about to do that? So we ask a lot of different questions and we focus on a lot of different things okay great question and we'll give final question to our grade sevens in california because i see someone waiting ever so patiently uh at the camera it's been there for a little bit so go ahead and fire off your question when i turn your mic on like that um what okay Why? what do you spy you tap the whales Sorry? Um, why, why, what do you expire about tapping the whales? So my, for me, I really want to make sure that this population of blue whales that nobody ever knew anything about till 10 years ago, uh, that more people in the world can learn about them because they're a very special population. Like I said, they break the rules that we thought we'd created for blue whales. But I also want to protect them. And there are lots of threats out here in the ocean. Um, they get, uh, we have giant container ships that can uh, hit them and the whales can get killed. Uh, they can get caught in fishing nets and they can get entangled. And remember, because they, if they can't get to the surface to breathe, they can drown and die. Um, there's a lot of problems in the ocean that they face as a result of our uh, human beings and our activities. And so my intention is to make sure that people are more aware about this population and that we can start to come up with ways to prevent them from dying as at our hands and so that we can all come together and come up with solutions for trying to protect them. So my aspiration really is to make sure that not just me and not just you, but not even just your children and your children's children, but like in centuries, people will be able to come out and marvel at these creatures and see what an incredible, incredible world we live in. Well, Asha, thank you so much. Um, 
you're a legend, you're amazing. I always love you. your stories and our, our hangouts. Um, thank you for helping us channel our inner explorers. Thank you no for problem. The, the tips going forward, particularly um, following your dreams, not giving up and chasing your dreams, being persistent but not annoying, very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, great, great for classrooms. Um, we're getting close to our log off point, but I do want to remind classrooms that you can check out National Geographic Education for all kinds of great resources, um, videos and such that you can use in the classroom. We also have a few more Explorer classrooms coming up this week. Tomorrow at one o'clock Eastern, we're connecting with Brian Scary, and he's going to share, he's an underwater photographer, and he's going to share an expedition uh, 10 years ago um, to New Zealand with the right whale. So it was a whale celebration this week. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't seen the photos, check them out. Right whales in New Zealand with Brian Scary. It's absolutely incredible. And then Thursday, we're connecting with Lee Berger, um, Explorer in Residence at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern. And he will be in South Africa, underground in the rising, car, or rising star cave system. Um, we'll have feeds underground with the people working and excavating um, fossils of Homo naledi, one of our recently discovered human ancestors. So lots of Nat Geo action this week. Um, but before we sign off, I will give the classrooms a chance to say goodbye and thank you. But I do want to thank you one more time, Asha, for another amazing hangout. No problem. Thank you so much for inviting me again and having me speak to these incredible little kid, people. I mean, you are the future. So make sure you have great dreams and make sure, you know, your dreams are positive. They're going to change the world. Believe you can do it and you will do it. So keep going. All right. Excellent. Well, microphones are coming on for those classrooms um, still with us. And then we're going to sign off for today. So here we go. Microphones on, guys. Nice and loud. Thank you for Asha. And we'll see you again next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We are signing off.